Can you believe it's the end of July? Where did it go? Wasn't it just the 4th of July? Weren't we just celebrating and waving flags and stuff? Oh my gosh. But it is the end of our fun summer series. We've done um, June and July with some stuff in outer space this year and had some fun with Star Trek last month and of course all the Star Wars movies this month. And um, we are going to complete our series on Star Wars with the last Star Wars movie that has been released, which was released last year, called The Last Jedi. Last year, last movie, last Jedi. It's the last of our series. It's kind of the end, right? So the main storyline of this whole Star Wars um, epic, I guess you would call it an epic, is it's three trilogies. And the first one, the prequel trilogy, is focuses on Anakin Skywalker. Remember, he later became Darth Vader when he went to the dark side. And then the original series, which was the first one that they showed us, that was based on Anakin's son, Luke Skywalker, and his sister, Leia. Remember those guys? Then the sequel trilogy, which is the one that we're in right now, is the last three, is on, focused on Kylo Ren, who's actually Ben Solo. Remember Han Solo from the original Star Wars movie? Ben is Han and Leia's son, and one of the Skywalkers as well. But he became um, uh, Kylo Ren. Kylo, yeah, Kylo Ren, which is the dark side kind of like Darth Vader. So he followed in his grandfather's footsteps from going from being the Jedi to going to the dark side. So he's kind of the um, protagonist, I guess, in this, in this uh, particular one. And they've introduced a character in the last movie, but not this one, that she's back in it again, called Rey. And she's a female hero. She's our Shiro, and uh, she's not related to the Skywalker family, at least that we know so far, right? They have surprises, not least that we know so far. And uh, they may be opening the door for some future franchises for them now that Disney's bought the series and so forth. So who knows? We could have another 42 years of the Star Wars series coming forward with this. So today, as I said, we're looking at the last film in the, the sequel that's been released. There's one more coming out next December, and it is called The Last Jedi. But let's watch the infamous crawler that's in the beginning that tells us what's going on. Maestro? Not sure where the applause came from, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you what's happening. They're kind of um, in a bind right now. The resistance is, and they're, they're really struggling. But since it's a sequel, what I thought we would do is do a real quick overview, because I had to look up some stuff to know who all these people were when I started watching this movie. It's like, what is going on? So Carrie Fisher, this was, she returned as, as General Leia in this one, in The Resistance. And this was Carrie's last movie before she passed away in December of 2016. So it's a very uh, sweet thing that she could be a part of that. Luke Skywalker, of course, he returns in the show as well, but he's a reclusive Jedi master who has exiled himself to a different place out in the universe. And he's no longer trying to save the universe or train Jedi Knights even. He's saying, nah, uh none of that stuff for me. This is Luke. Because he failed Ben Solo, and he feels so bad about failing his nephew and his sister, and uh, because he ultimately went to the dark side. But then Han died in a previous movie, so they didn't reincarnate him for this show, so he's not in it. But C-3PO, the little um, droid, and R2-D2, the Millennium Falcon, and Chewbacca, big Chewbacca, they're all back in this show. And it's kind of fun from that standpoint to see all those characters still still hanging out. And of course we had to have an appearance by the Jedi Master Yoda, right? It's his ghost, but Yoda had to be in the movie as well. Confused yet? Yeah, you know, you need a diagram, right? But in this movie, they've changed the name of the Empire, the evil ones. They've changed it to the First Order. They've changed it to the First Order. And the rebels are no longer the rebels. They are the Resistance. They've got a bigger name. They're the Resistance. So the First Order, of course, is the dark side. And the rebels, or the Resistance, is the light side. And this has been that reoccurring theme, hasn't it? Of the good and the evil. The two sides of this force thing that they've been, they keep talking about. And it turns out we find that the Jedi Knights are virtually extinct at this time in history. They're virtually, or in the future, I guess, it's not history. It's virtually, they're virtually extinct, and the resistance is all but defeated. So it's a very 
um, scary time for, for them right now. But even though it's bleak, General Leia just knows that her brother, Master Jedi Luke Skywalker, is going to come save the day and give the Resistance hope that they can return to their strength and save the universe. So what she does is she sends this new Shiro, Rey, to go find Master Luke and train with him. And by the way, bring him back to us because we need him to help us. So Ray goes off and she finds him in uh, this, ex this deserted island. And um, he says, uh-uh, no way. I don't do that anymore. I don't train Jedi Knights. And I am certainly not going back to that resistance with you. Mm -mm, not going to happen. Then R2-D2 comes up. And remember that video in the first one where Leia is appealing to Obi-Wan? Please save us, Obi-Wan. Remember that little hologram that he projected? He still has that. R2-D2 does. So he shows it to Luke. And he, Luke just shakes his head. He said, that's not fair. That's not fair. So he agrees to train Ray, But he still says he's not going back. He says, I'm not going back with you. But I'll train you. So the first lesson that he tries to teach Ray is the same one that Yoda tried to teach him. If you remember in the swamp. Which was, what is this thing called the Force? What is this thing called the Force? And it, it's, it's that all-encompassing, around everything, in, through, and as everything, encompassing everything, life itself. And he's explaining this to her. And once she begins to grasp the nature of the force, he then makes a very profound statement. He says to her, the force is too big to have ever belonged exclusively to the Jedi religion. The Force is too big to ever have belonged exclusively to the Jedi religion. To say the Jedi die, if the Jedi die, the light dies, is vanity. Wow. So Luke explaining the Force and that it's not the exclusive domain of just the Jedis is probably one of the most metaphysical pieces of this movie. And I really like the way he presented it because he contends that the Jedi Order actually needs to be extinct. He's like, I don't need to train any more knights. They need to go away. He says their arrogance, or hubris was the word that he kept using in the movie. Their arrogance, their hubris, is what has caused their failure. This is coming from Luke Skywalker. Profound, isn't it? Their arrogance has called, caused their failure. And that's my talk today. That's what we're going to talk about is have the Jedi, Jedi, in fact, failed? Have they failed in their understanding of the Force? Have they failed in their mission to use it and in the protection of the universe? Eight movies in. Wow. Eight movies in. Ernest Holmes, the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living and the author of The Science of Mind that we teach from, he says that failure is the death of the old and the new, so that the new may become manifest. Failure is the death of the old that the new may become manifest. It is a recognition, a recognition of this is the first step toward progress. A recognition of this is the first step toward progress. Failure. Career, relationships, finance, health, diet, fitness, plan, all those things. Failure. It feels bad, doesn't it, when we fail? When we don't succeed at something that we have sat before ourselves that this is, this is what I want to achieve in my life. And we don't. And we feel bad. We feel disappointed. We feel disillusioned. Maybe even depressed. It's not a good feeling. So how can I stand here and agree with Holmes that it's the first step toward progress? Because I've been there. And I would bet so have you. When we experience failure, we've got two choices right there, don't we? One is to dust ourselves off, get up, learn from it, and move on. The other is to sit right there. To stay in it. To wallow in it to stay in that failure, and to believe that we cannot create again something new for ourselves outside of that failure. That that's all that there is. We have blinders on, so to speak. 
Holmes tells us that failure is neither person, place, nor thing. It is a false thought and has no truth in it. It is a belief in lack, and there is no lack. It is a belief in a limitation that does not exist. Failure is a belief in lack. That there's not enough. That I failed, and that's all there is, and I'm done. There's not any more. That was it. One shot. Done. I think that's the direction that he's going with this. He's, he says that we may have forgotten that we live in an infinite intelligence. It's ever available to us with the answers and the solutions and the clarity that we need, forever guiding us. That we maybe have forgotten that we are connected to, through, and as the divine. That we live, move, and have our being in God as God lives, moves, and has its being within us. We may believe that we are this limited world of effects that we live in. That that's all that there is. But we know in infinite possibilities there's so much more, isn't there? So much more beyond what we see on the surface that is surrounding us. But when we focus on that and we get hooked into that which is in our experience, we can continue to manifest that. It kind of becomes a loop, doesn't it? Because we think we're stuck there. Holmes says if we failed last year and believe we will fail this year, we will likely fail until we change the belief. Isn't that the basis of the science of mind teaching? Change your thinking, change your life. Ever heard that? Yeah. And that's what he's talking about here is that when we, we can get caught in that loop of believing in failure, believing that we're not enough, believing in lack, believing in that we're not worthy for some reason, and that's forgetting that connection to the divine that we are, that we are all individualized expression of the one, that we are children of the Most High, that we live in an abundant universe that is here to give to us, to serve us. According to Mr. Webster, he says failure is a lack of success. Anybody know the Edison story? Inventing the light bulb. How many times did he fail? 1,000, exactly. 1,000 times. 10,000? He says 10,000. 100,000. Twice, right? But he did not believe in a lack of yet another experiment, did he? He just kept going. He's like, well, that one didn't work. Let's try this one. That one didn't work. Let's try this one. And he kept going and going and going. It wasn't a failure to him. It was proving what wasn't working and that was okay, but there wasn't lack of another experiment for him to try to get us these great light bulbs, right? Yeah. And that's the direction that Holmes is talking to us about. And it's easy sometimes, I think, for us to get stuck in that loop of failure. Bad things happen in threes. You know that? Bad things happen in threes. It's always something. It's always something. Life's hard. Life is hard. Isn't it? Yeah. That's the kind of stuff, isn't it? When we can get hooked into that, we listen to ourselves say that, or people say that to us and we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got to clean up our language around that stuff. Expecting the bad and what happens? It usually shows up. It usually shows up. So failure as a belief in lack is getting stuck in these effects that are temporary. Because effects are temporary, aren't they? Everything's temporary, really, right? We're not the people we were starting in January. We're not the people we were yesterday. Everything is temporary. Our bodies are constantly changing. Our world is constantly changing. Our thoughts are constantly changing. So there's always something new to be created. And sometimes we just get stuck, don't we? We need an idea. We need a desire. I know in, in religious science it's very easy because we, we create and we've manifested some great goal that we've been working on and we're so excited about it and then there's a hollowness that starts to come. If you've ever manifested something large in your life that you've worked on for a very long time and then there's a hollowness that may show up that's like, well, what's next? That was very exciting in that creation time of building my business or losing the weight or whatever it might have been. But what's next? And we need a new desire, don't we? 
We want to work on something else. We want to grow. We want to evolve. We want to create. And we can pray for an idea. We can pray for a new desire in our hearts to be planted just as easily as we can pray for a car or a career. That's how treatment works. That's how treatment works. Ernest Holmes reminds us that we should not despise apparent failures, the temporary chagrins of life, for they're salutary. Leading the soul to the inner Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, when the experience is complete, the lessons will be learned, and we shall enter the paradise of contentment. The lessons will be learned. So moving back to our movie, Ray, our new Shiro, she leaves this island without Luke. She's had some training, but they had a little conflict. So she said, I, I'm done with this. I've got what I need. I'm going to leave. So she leaves, and Luke now is thoroughly, thoroughly disenchanted with the Jedi thing. And he has been the caretaker of the sacred texts of the temple library, and he's decided he's going to destroy it. And he gets his little light stick, and he starts walking up to destroy the big library and stuff, and he stops, he hesitates, he pauses. Let's see what happens. Pass on what you have learned. Strength, mastery, sure, but failure folly, mistakes. Failure is the greatest teacher there is. And then he makes another profound statement where he says, we are what they grow beyond. And that is the true burden of all masters. It's true of every generation, isn't it? If we go back to the Christ, this and more you too shall do. That was part of his message, wasn't it? This and more you shall do. Knowing that we would grow and evolve beyond the teaching that he had at that time. We see it with our youth today. We've seen it throughout the civilization of mankind. That growth and expansion. Growing beyond the current generation. So when we learn from today's experiences and failures, we, then we grow beyond them. And growing from our failures, growing from our failures, expansion and continuing our own upward evolution, that's what we're here for, isn't it? That's what we're here for. That's our purpose. So let's take a look now at our practicing the principles for this week and see how we might be able to incorporate some of this into our week this week. Our first one is the answering the question, have the Jedi failed? Have the Jedi failed? Yoda just said it's time for the order to end. Is it? And Luke believes that the order has failed and its mission to protect the galaxy. He says the legacy of the Jedi is failure, hypocrisy, hubris, and arrogance. He tells Ray how from the earliest days of the prominence of the Jedi, when they were ruling that they still continuously allowed evil in the universe. In the Sith, remember those guys? The Empire or the First Order to rise and re repeatedly allowing the institutions like the Republic, like the Resistance, to fail and to allow the Jedi Order itself to now fail by not staying strong. So they're questioning this. But if you remember Master Yoda's words where he said, pass on what you've learned. Failure most of all is the greatest teacher. Can we fail? Can we really fail? Holmes says failure is a, black in be a belief in lack which suggests we believe that we can't create anew. That we don't live in this abundant universe that we don't have access to the divine intelligence that surrounds and permeates us. That's really what a, a belief in lack is, isn't it? That there's just not enough for me. It's enough for everybody else, but not enough for me. And we know that's just simply not true. 
In reality, we do not fail, we grow. Failure is an opportunity to learn beyond what we know. Again, Edison, he learned a lot in those 1,000 or 10,000 experiments that he did, didn't he? He learned a lot until he finally came upon the solution to his problem that he was seeking. So it's not a matter of failure, it's a matter of continuing the creative process and allowing it to flow through us. Number two, the Jedi don't own the light. The Jedi don't own the light. Religious scientists and new thought does not own the spiritual principles and the law. Christianity does not own Christ. It's too big. He says the force is too big to be in simply one order. And isn't that true? Universal, spiritual principle, means universal. To say that the, if the Jedi die, the light dies is vanity. In reality, the law or the force works alike for all. Universe plays no favorites. You ever heard that? You believe it? Yeah. And we see in this movie, if we think about really the, the bigger perspective of what, what they're trying to tell us, I think, because we see that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker, who was a Jedi, who was trained in the positive use of the Force and went to the dark side. But he's still using the Force, isn't he? And we see the same thing with Ben Solo. Ben was using, being trained as a Jedi Knight and using the Force. And he went to the dark side. But he's still using the Force. He still plays around with the lightsabers. He can still move people around and throw energy and all those other things that the Jedis do. It's one Force. It's one power in the universe. You heard Reverend Glenn in his prayer talk about the many paths to the one God. It doesn't matter what religion we practice, does it? It doesn't matter what faith tradition we hold. There's one God. There's one power. There's one presence. So it's good to remember that this law plays no favorites. And we've heard as far back as the Bible that the sun shines on the just and the unjust. It plays no favorites. The sun can grow a plant or it can blister our bodies, can it? Yeah, sure can. That's not playing favorites. I'm going to burn this one, but I'm not going to burn that one. Right? Number three. All right, last time I'm going to tell you. Stop playing small. Seriously. At the very end of the movie, we have a great example of this. And this scene was highly debated. And um, we've got the group in the Millennium Falcon. There's like 20 of the remaining... Um, resistance fighters who get in under the Millennium Falcon while Luke is fighting off um, the bad guy, whatever his name was, and they escape. So that's all good. Everybody's celebrating. Yay, yay, yay. Well, then we go to the scene, back to a, a planet that they had been on before where we had been introduced to these children who were actually slaves, and they were working in a stable. And the kids are now, they've heard about this epic battle of Luke Skywalker coming back to Jedi. And they're imitating that little play. Their imaginations, right? They're playing in their imaginations with this great story of this great hero. And their master comes out and he shoes them away. And we follow one little boy outside. And as he walks out, it's dark. And he, he reaches over for his broom. And it leaps into his hand. And then he walks out and he sort of starts dreamily sweeping the street a little bit and then he stops and he's gazing out at the stars and we see a, a shooting star and he's just gazing out with that beautiful look on his face and they show a um, resistance ring that one of the previous characters had given him so there he stands just gazing off and we wonder that is he the future is he using the force is he a Skywalker? Probably not. So this is indicative of the Force is there for everyone if they believe. And the director, Ryan Johnson, he said he wanted to show how Skywalker's stand against the First Order inspired the galaxy. 
because throughout the movie in several places it was talking about how hope had been lost. If you remember the first movie was something about hope and now they said uh, very frequently the wrist isn't that hope was all hope was gone. All hope was gone. And he's saying no we want to show that the galaxy is now inspired. They've seen this beacon of hope in Luke Skywalker. They've heard about the success of the resistance. And they are now inspired to fight a good fight. So Luke's taking action, playing large, playing big, getting off the island, going back to help the resistance, doing what he did, playing large, inspired the entire galaxy. So Marianne Williamson's quote that we used last week, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, it is that we are powerful beyond measure. Playing sur- small doesn't serve the world or the universe. And we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do so. That little boy's got permission now, doesn't he? I've got the ring. I've got the force. I can see my future. Because Luke told me it was possible from his actions. Inspired hope in the galaxy. So as we're ending this series this week, I've been thinking about this 42 years. 42 years of this saga, of these movies. And just looking back, really, at life. I was an 18-year-old girl in Virginia, southwest Virginia, just waiting to graduate my high school year and get gone. And this movie first one came out and now here I am a minister in a spiritual center didn't see that coming (laughs) I reflected on some of my failures some of my recoveries and some of my growth from those failures over these past 42 years I thought about technology because we see some zoomy technology in these movies don't we Even from when they started in 77, the quality of the special effects to what they are today. And I look at the technology in my life. We didn't have cell phones, fax machines. We still had pay phones, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've looked at the reality of life changing in America from where we were in the late 70s to where we are today. And our planet shrinking, our world shrinking through the communication ability that we have through our internet. We've become closer and yet more disjointed in some ways too. Is space travel that far off? Will we be zipping around the universe like the Millennium Falcon? Is it in our near future? Bigger question today, will we become proficient at using this force of knowing our divinity, of knowing our connection to the divine, of using universal spiritual law and truth in our lives? As the final scene in that movie shows with that little boy looking off, there's always hope, isn't there? We say that 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 hope is not the most powerful emotion that we have. It's the first one, though, sometimes, isn't it? When we're coming up from one of those failures, it's the first rung on the ladder that we can get to is hope. Is hope. And to know that there's always hope, even if it feels like it's a long time away and a galaxy far away, there's hope. So I want to close today with a final quote from Ernest Holmes. And it's actually more of an affirmation, I think, than it is just, just a quote of his. And he tells us, there are no delays in the divine plan for me. No delays. Nothing can hinder the operation of this law in my life and actions. Obstructions are removed from my path, and I now enter into the realization and manifestation of complete fulfillment of right desires. I do not have to wait. The law waits upon me at every turn in life's road. And the law waits upon you as well. So peace and blessings to each of us. May the force be with you. And so it is. 
So I want to thank you all for being with us today and for the whole month for this series, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. It is our fun summer series that we, we do something a little wacky every summer just because it's hot in Arizona. But if you were with us for the very first time, I hope that you have found us to your liking and that you will come back and visit us again. And um, when you leave, our welcome committee has another token of appreciation for you if you'd like to see the folks out by the front table as you leave this morning. And now I would invite you, if you would, Join me in an affirmative prayer. How good it is that we come together on this beautiful Sunday morning in celebration of life, in celebration of love, of peace, of the wholeness that life is as we recognize that there is only one, one infinite power, one infinite presence that is in through and as all of life and that power, that presence is God. It is the source of all, it is the essence, it is presence, it is law, and it is the force. No matter what we call it, no matter what we call it, just that we have that relationship and knowing that inner divinity, for we are all each individualized and unique manifestations of it from the one source. Whole, perfect, and complete in this manifestation, knowing our own divinity. So as I know that for myself and for each one of us here today, I speak my word for and about us, knowing that whatever failures we may believe we are experiencing now, recovering from, or anticipating, we let go of any concept of lack within that, knowing that we have an opportunity to grow, to expand, to evolve in this thing called life. And I know for anyone this day that has anything on their heart that they're seeking prayer around, as they bring that into their awareness, we know that it is healed. It is whole. Clarity is revealed. Abundance flows, be it ideas or financial, whatever the need is. It is met here this day. And so it is with a grateful heart that I simply release this into the activity of law, into the activity of mind, knowing that it's done. The word spoken is the word made manifest. And we affirm that together by saying, and so it is. <laughs> 